Hi, this is Gordon Goldsboro of the Manitoba Historical Society. Earlier today, I spoke with Nadia Kidwai of CBC Radio 1's Weekend Morning Show about my five years of talking about interesting historic places around Manitoba. And I identified my favourite ten places. Of course, it was really difficult winnowing the list down to ten. I've recorded 239 episodes of Abandoned Manitoba, and I enjoyed every single one of them. How to pick just ten? Well, essentially, I asked myself what stories I found most compelling, you know, ones that I still thought about years later. And on that basis, I found there were a handful that still especially resonated with me. But if anyone is interested in going back and listening to all five years of episodes, some 18 hours, audio files for them are available for free on the Manitoba Historical Society website. Well, let's get underway. I'm going to show you some pictures and some thoughts about each of the places on my top 10 list. Our first stop is Matchetville School number 1342 in the municipality of Norfolk Treehern, located about five miles north of the town of Treehern, Manitoba. Back in August of 2015, I spoke about my fascination with this little one-room building. It had been named for members of the Matchett family who homesteaded in this region over a hundred years ago, although local lore claims that it was actually originally called Bachelorville due to the scarcity of women in the early days of settlement and it was later renamed Matchetville when the bachelors married. Uh, a nice story, but I don't think there's much basis to it. Well, of course, as farm families became more numerous in the area, they had children who needed an education. So the Matchetville School District was formed in May of 1905. The following year, 1906, the school trustees arranged to have a school building constructed. They hired a farmer named Frank Thompson from the Austin area, north of the Assiniboine River, to make them some large blocks from which they constructed the school. Thompson used locally sourced sand and gravel mixed with cement powder and water to make concrete. By the way, people often use the words cement and concrete interchangeably, but they're really different. Cement being the glue that holds together all the ingredients, and concrete being the finished product. So we can talk about a concrete wall, but we wouldn't normally talk about a cement wall because it's actually only made of partially of cement. Anyway, when the school was done, the students had a solid building with a row of three small windows on its south-facing side in which to attend classes. Students in every grade from one up to nine or ten crowded into that single classroom with just one teacher. There were no indoor toilets, just an outhouse on the school grounds, and no other amenities that we expect from modern schools, such as a library, a gymnasium, a computer lab. That's why I think it is so important to remember these little one-room schools, because they remind us of the transformation that occurred in our educational system, and especially starting in the 1960s with school consolidation during which many of these little one-room schools closed. In the case of Matchetville, it closed in 1951 due to declining enrollment, and afterwards, children from the Matchetville area were bused to a school in Treherne. The former schoolhouse, still as solid as the day it was made, was sold to a local farmer for one dollar, and he used it as a granary to store his harvests. Unfortunately, as you can see in this photo, the building sustained major structural damage when, in August of 2003, it was run into by a combine, allegedly driven by someone under the influence of alcohol. The farmer, whose granary was damaged, received a cash payment that allowed him to buy a new steel granary to replace it, so he did not perceive a need to repair the old schoolhouse. Consequently, it is now open to weather, wildlife, and vandals, I worry that this fine example of a former schoolhouse, now over 100 years old, will deteriorate and eventually fall down. Our second stop is a small grain elevator in the village of Elva, located about six miles southwest of the town of Melita in the municipality of Two Borders. In the early 20th century, 
This photo of the village of Tilston, not far from Elva, would have been typical of many agricultural communities around southern Manitoba. They were established when the railways came to Manitoba in the late 19th century, and the only way to get from town to town was by train. So most towns of any size had a train station, like the one we see here. They also had at least one grain elevator, where farmers could bring their grain to be sold. Then it would be stored temporarily until the grain could be loaded into a boxcar for shipment to eastern Canada and other destinations. The three elevators we see here are referred to as standard plans because, by and large, they conformed to a standard construction specification. A farmer would deliver grain to one side of the elevator where it would be elevated, hence the name elevator, up to the top of the building then rooted into one of several storage bins awaiting shipment. When a boxcar sat on the opposite side of the elevator, the grain would be poured into it until full, then the boxcar would be boarded up and shipped on its way. At one time, there were over 700 grain elevators around Manitoba. As a result, many people today think of a grain elevator as a symbol of the prairies. Yet, over the past 60 years, the number of elevators has been declining, so there are now fewer than 100 in operation here in Manitoba. Many more elevators, being too small to be efficient for modern agriculture, sit vacant and awaiting the gradual ravages of time, demolition, random lightning bolts, or, frankly, a match. The elevator at Elva, however, is special. My research determined that it was constructed in September of 1897 by the Lake of the Woods Milling Company, a company that operated flour mills at Kewaitan, Ontario, today's Kenora, Portis La Prairie, Medicine Hat in Alberta, and Brantford, Ontario. It had a network of elevators across the prairies, including nearly 70 of them here in Manitoba. In November of 1954, most of the company's assets including the elevator at Elva, were sold to one of its competitors, the Ogilvy Flour Mills Company. Although for reasons unknown, the original corporate name remained on the Elva elevator. Five years later, in 1959, Ogilvy sold the elevators to Manitoba Pool Elevators. Being small, old, and in poor repair, Manitoba Pool closed the one at Elva in 1968 and sold it to private ownership. As far as I've been able to determine, the elevator has not been used for grain storage in decades. What makes the elevator at Elva significant is that it is the oldest standard plan grain elevator in all of Manitoba, and in fact, all of Canada. When I first visited this interesting little elevator a few years ago, its doors were still intact. And although it had some obvious damage to its metal cladding, I thought that it still had potential for restoration as an important historic structure. Unfortunately, the decline seems to be progressing rapidly. When I visited the elevator again in 2019, the roof had many openings so that snow and rain can now filter in, causing the wooden parts to rot much more rapidly than otherwise. Vandals have forced open the doors, so it is now easy to go inside, although one has to be very careful because the floors are becoming quite soft. I fear this elevator will not be around much longer. Our fourth site is an object lesson in the importance of being respectful when investigating abandoned buildings in rural Manitoba. The Lang House is a two-story stone residence located about nine miles southeast of Larivir. It was a fine structure constructed of locally collected fieldstones that had been split in half and worked into solid flat walls by stonemason Jim Willocks for David and Catherine Lang. They came to southern Manitoba from Montreal, Quebec in 1879. Construction of the house started in 1896 and was completed in February 1897. Measuring 33 feet by 35 feet, it was constructed at a cost of $2,500, a princely sum in those days, and was reported to contain some of the most beautiful woodwork and the finest staircase in the region. 
The Langs, who had no children, were famous for their house parties and dances. Catherine Lang died in 1913 and was buried in the nearby Mackenzie Cemetery. David Lang returned to Quebec and died there around 1923. The house and property was sold to the Moore family, who lived there until the late 1950s or the early 1960s. In late 1979, heavy dimensional lumber was salvaged from the house's interior, along with fine cedar paneling and the staircase. The front door was recycled as the main entrance into a honey house at a nearby farm. When I visited it, with the permission of the landowner, in early 2015, much of the interior was gone. The lath and plaster walls had sustained considerable vandalism. The skeleton of an old wood stove still stood in the kitchen. On the exterior, near the roof line, letters and numbers proclaimed its name, albeit unreadably, and the year of construction. 1896. Now, I first spoke about the Lang House in the abandoned Manitoba series in October of 2015. I soon discovered that my enthusiasm for the house was definitely not appreciated by the farmer who owned it, because he had had considerable trouble with numerous people who had visited the house without permission through the years. Because the house was located far out in his field, visitors would often trample his crops driving out to it, causing him real economic loss. To add insult to injury, they left garbage strewn about that he would have to clear up, and he worried about the liability if the sh increasingly shaky old building fell down with somebody inside. Finally, after years of frustration, the farmer had had enough. He burned the wooden parts of the house in a dramatic fire and sent me this photo of it in flames, then used his heavy equipment to knock down the remaining walls. In short, the Lang House is no more. It's sad that a house that withstood the ravages of prairie weather for over a century met such an end. But I fully support the farmer's actions. It is imperative that those of us who love to visit such old places keep in mind that we must do it respectfully without jeopardizing the opportunity for future visitors. Whenever possible, try to secure permission from the landowner before visiting a site, although I acknowledge this is not always easy to do, and never cause damage to the property. Take nothing but photographs, leave nothing but footprints. I heard about Port Nelson, a seaport on Hudson Bay that preceded Churchill but was never finished, several years ago. It was on my personal bucket list, but it's not an easy place to visit. Back in 2017, I had an opportunity to go there with several adventurous friends. We met a tour guide downstream of Manitoba Hydro's limestone generating station. We boarded his boat for the trip down the Nelson River. Along the way, we shot through some treacherous rapids and cruised along the river at the heady speed of 80 kilometers an hour. From limestone to Port Nelson, it is about 120 kilometers by water, and the trip took us about an hour and three quarters. Now, construction of Port Nelson began in 1913 as the terminus of the Hudson Bay Railway, the idea being that it would provide a shorter route for the shipping of prairie grain to overseas markets. A right-of-way from the Paw was constructed all the way to the bay. The mouth of the Nelson River is naturally shallow, so to provide a deep water port, an artificial island was constructed about one half mile offshore using a 180-foot dredge, dubbed the Million Dollar Dredge, because of the cost of building and moving it from southern Canada. Between 1915 and 1916, an impressive 17-span steel truss bridge was erected out to the artificial island. The plan was to construct a large grain terminal on the island. Unfortunately, construction was interrupted by the outbreak of the First World War. Resources that were needed for the war effort were diverted from Port Nelson, and construction workers enlisted in military forces, so the construction site was basically shut down in anticipation of resuming when the war was over. In the 1920s, it was determined that the port of Churchill, at the mouth of the Churchill River to the north, was better suited to the needs of commercial shipping. For one thing, it was a natural deep-water port that would not require frequent dredging simply to allow ships to get to the artificial island. 
So the unfinished facility at Port Nelson, along with the railway bridge, was simply abandoned without ever having been used, with a total expenditure of millions of federal dollars. Now, remarkably, the bridge remains intact. This, a century later, despite having had absolutely no maintenance in the intervening years. The million-dollar dredge lies abandoned on the artificial island, where it was deposited during a storm in late 1924. I spent about three hours exploring the artificial island. I was amazed at how much construction equipment and debris was still strewn around. I walked across three spans of the old bridge. Walking on it turned out to be a real challenge because its wooden parts were so incredibly rotten. I could feel my feet sinking into the railway ties as I stepped on them. The thought of falling through to the bay below was, well, obviously not appealing, and we spent far more time walking a short distance than we had expected. So our plan to walk to the mainland and see what buildings and equipment were still there, regretfully, had to be abandoned. But I did get time to climb all over the old dredge, including inside, where we saw its steam boiler, its other mechanical systems, and its crew quarters. Unfortunately, three hours flew by very quickly. So I look forward to visiting Port Nelson again someday. My plan would be to spend the night on the island so I have an ample time to see everything. In 1891, a former provincial reformatory on Brandon's North Hill was converted into a facility for mentally impaired people. Known initially as the Brandon Asylum for the Insane, it was later renamed the Brandon Hospital for Mental Diseases. In truth, treatment of people admitted to the hospital was limited. In effect, it was a prison, with no real hope of treatment or release back into society. In 1919, Two visiting psychiatrists from Eastern Canada were horrified at what they found in Brandon, and in a report submitted to the provincial government, they recommended sweeping reforms. The Valley View building, named for its panoramic view of the Assiniboine River Valley to the south, was built in direct response to that report. It would enable new approaches to mental health care to be applied. Constructed between 1920 and 1924, the three-story Valley View was intended to house newly arrived patients. It consisted of three blocks connected by corridors. The northernmost block contained staff accommodations and laboratories. The central block contained kitchens and dining rooms on the lower level and an operating room, infirmary, and therapeutic rooms on the upper levels. The southernmost block housed female patients on its east wing and male patients on the west. Now, on a personal note, my great-grandmother, who emigrated to Canada from the United Kingdom in 1928, was one of the first people to be admitted to the Valley View, and she died there of unknown causes. Her son, my grandfather, had not been especially impressed by Canada and had decided that he was going to move back to the UK. But he was devastated at the death of his mother, and he resolved that he could not leave her behind. So he stayed, met my grandmother, and developed, well, over time, a more favorable view of the country. Without the premature death of my great-grandmother in the Valley View, it is likely that my grandparents would have never met. For my own sake, I'm sure glad they did. As the prevailing methods for the treatment of people with mental illness changed through the 20th century, the need for facilities like the one at Brandon waned. The Valley View building closed in 1992, and the rest of the surrounding buildings were closed by 1999. The Valley View has stood empty for nearly 30 years. An urban explorer who walked around inside it a few years ago shared with me a few photos, showing, among other things, the old washrooms and laboratories, showing the effects of prolonged neglect. Recently, I heard that the Assiniboine Community College has plans to renovate this remarkable building, which symbolizes for me a new, more enlightened approach to the treatment of mental illness. If these plans come to fruition, I hope the old Valley View building will enjoy many more years of useful life. At the height of the Cold War, the Canadian government decided that it needed to have an early warning system in case the Soviets sent a bomber carrying nuclear weapons over the North Pole. 
they implemented the distant early warning, or dew line, in the high Arctic, along with two other lines further south, the Mid-Canada line and the Pine Tree line. A little-known component of this early warning system was a building constructed in Churchill. Its official reason to exist was to host research on the impact of the Northern Lights on military radio transmissions, but its unstated purpose was to spy on Soviet radio communications and to relay any intercepted bomber transmissions to interceptor jets. The facility at Churchill was dubbed Her Majesty's Canadian Station Churchill, or HMCS Churchill. The T-shaped, metal-clad, two-story building was constructed in the late 1950s, near the site of the now-demolished Fort Churchill military base. Today, the building stands along the highway, running from the Churchill Airport into town. It contained barracks, eating and recreation space, mechanical shops, water and sewer handling facilities, offices, and a high-security area where the listening equipment was located. A remarkable aspect of its architecture was that the building was constructed on piles that elevated it about six feet above the ground. The building's floor was heavily insulated and heated to protect the interior from the cold weather outside. The idea was to allow a warm building to stand atop permanently frozen ground without shifting. It was an amazingly innovative building for its time, and I learned that engineers and architects from around the world, including ones from the Soviet Union, came to see this construction marvel. Operation of HMCS Churchill continued to June of 1965, when most of its personnel were transferred to Ottawa or to Inuvik. The complex was closed fully in June of 1968. There were various attempts to repurpose the building. Among the ideas proposed were for a job training higher educational and research center. Unfortunately, none of these plans came to fruition. The building has sat vacant for the past 50 plus years. I first saw the building in the early 1980s when I spent a month in Churchill. My wife and I had explored its interior, so I had a basic idea of the layout. But in the intervening decades, I had forgotten a lot and I assumed that much had changed. When I had an opportunity to visit again in 2018, I found that it had acquired a colorful exterior paint job, complements of a public art program. I had a close look at its unique permafrost architecture that allowed it to be straight and plumb despite decades of neglect. Some of its exterior metal paneling had been scavenged and its water tower had been disassembled and removed. The provincial government, which owns the building today, had boarded up all of its windows and doors, except one. I spent over three hours wandering around inside, taking literally hundreds of photos. I was able to walk down long forgotten corridors like this one in the residential wing of the building, painted in the pastel colors of the 1950s and 60s. A particular highlight was that I was able to see the high security area where I would have never been permitted to visit if I had been there in its heyday. HMCS Churchill is an important reminder of Canada's Cold War history, and the building is an example of many otherwise useful buildings around Manitoba that, it seems to me, could be reused if only a productive purpose could be found for them. I love science fiction, and especially when it involves time travel, perhaps because it allows me to indulge my twin loves of science and history. The closest experience that I have ever had to time travel was my visit to the Negrich family homestead, located northwest of Dauphin, about 12 miles north of Gilbert Plains. The site has been described as the best preserved pioneer homestead in all of North America, an assessment with which I heartily agree. As one travels the long driveway into the homestead, it's like the years are peeling away until you arrive at the buildings, still neatly maintained as though the Negriches are still living there. The homestead was established in 1897 by Ukrainian immigrants Vassil and Annie Negrich, along with their seven children. Initially, they built a Buddha, an A-frame type of temporary structure made of poplar poles covered in cowhide. The large family lived in the Buddha until they could build a more permanent house in 1899, and it still stands at the site today. 
the 15 by 35 foot structure is made of tamarack logs covered inside and out with homemade mud plaster, made by mixing clay, straw, cow manure, and water, and made strikingly white by adding laundry bluing to the wet mixture prior to use. The roof is covered with wood shingles. Following a floor plan popular in their Ukrainian homeland, the Negrich home has three rooms, one large central room with a smaller side room on each side. Beneath the building was a root cellar for storing potatoes, onions, and carrots through the winter. Here, the Negriches had five more children, bringing their family to 12, six girls and six boys. They also built nine other buildings on the site, including a bunkhouse, built in 1908 to accommodate the boys, a cow barn, a pig pen, chicken coop, and three granaries, all made of logs. Inside the bunkhouse was a peach, a log and clay cook stove that was once the heart of every Ukrainian home, and which probably also provided the additional benefit of heating the bunkhouse in winter. Surrounding the buildings was a vegetable and herb garden, an orchard with plums, sour cherries, and six varieties of apples. Fields were cut from the surrounding forest, where the Negriches grew grain and hay for their livestock. Vassil Negrich died in 1927, and Anna lived until 1944. Both were buried in the Kolomaya Cemetery, also called the Negrich Cemetery, that's located nearby. The youngest of the six daughters, Annie, continued to live in the original house into her 80s, while her brother Stephen, who for many years had worked as a teacher at one-room schoolhouses in the region, lived in the bunkhouse. The site had no electricity or telephone service. Lighting was provided by kerosene lamps, and heat came from stoves fueled by firewood. There was no running water other than the water flowing in the drifting river about a hundred feet away from the house, into which Annie dipped buckets to collect water for household use. Right into the 1980s, the two surviving Negrich children lived pretty much as their ancestors had done for generations. Eventually, Annie moved into Gilbert Plains and died there in late 1988. Stephen remained at the homestead until 1990 when he moved into Dauphin. He died in June 1992, the last of the pioneer generation of Negriches. He was buried in the Kolomaya Cemetery, along with Annie and other members of his extended family. The homestead began opening for public visits in 1994, and restoration continued through the 1990s. Now owned by the municipality of Gilbert Plains and leased to the Gilbert Plains and District Historical Society, the homestead was designated as a provincial historic site in 1992, and a national historic site in 1996. It is definitely worth a visit to see how hardy Ukrainian pioneers were able to carve out a good life for themselves in Manitoba, and in so doing, create a better life for their descendants. Manitoba's economy has long been based on natural resources, and one of the resources that for many decades sustained a large industry in the boreal forest of eastern Manitoba was papermaking at the company town of Pine Falls. In 1924, lumberman John MacArthur acquired land on the bank of the Winnipeg River, near Fort Alexander, to form the Manitoba Pulp and Paper Company. A modern newsprint mill was constructed there through 1926, and the first paper was produced in January of 1927. The mill made 250 tons of paper each day, with about 300 men working at the mill and another 300 to 400 in logging camps to supply the mill with wood. By 1976, the mill, at that time the only newspaper-making facility on the prairies, was making 250 tons of paper a day for a million 48-page newspapers. It consumed three and three-quarter billion gallons of water a year and 265,000 megawatt hours of electricity. Its timber supply came from a large area on the east side of Lake Winnipeg, over halfway up the lake, and also in the interlake on the west side of the lake. In 1994, the mill was sold to employees as the Pine Falls Paper Company, which, in turn, sold it to Tembeck in early 1998. 
as environmental regulations became tougher through the late 20th century, it became increasingly difficult for the aging mill to be compliant with its discharges into the air, soil, and adjacent river. Between 1999 and 2001, the company built a state-of-the-art thermomechanical pulping, or TMP, mill at a cost of $125 million. This newer technology replaced two older pulping technologies, stone groundwood pulping and sulfite pulping. This change had an immediate positive effect. One was that the town no longer smelled of rotten eggs all the time. The new TMP mill gave off a pleasant smell of wood shavings and produced so much waste heat that a heat recovery unit reduced the mill's requirement for coal. Consequently, greenhouse gas emissions decreased by about 50%. Unfortunately, the mill fell victim to changes in the way that people get their news. At one time, nearly every Manitoba household subscribed to a newspaper. By the early 21st century, however, barely one in five households did so as they turned to online news sources. Newspapers, which had been a common feature of many Manitoba communities, began to close, and this trend continues right up to the present. Several small newspapers closed in early 2020. The Pine Falls paper mill closed in September 2009, less than 10 years after its new TMP mill became fully operational. Demolition began in 2011. By the spring of 2014, the once dominant paper mill was gone. The only remaining signs that I saw when I took this aerial photo in mid-2017 were some piles of scrap steel, a hydro substation erected in early 2000 when the new mill was being built, and a relatively new diesel locomotive that stands abandoned because the railway tracks on which it could travel to the outside world have been removed. This once dominant element of this area of Manitoba is now gone. An engineer who deserves to be remembered is William Chase. Born at St. Catharines, Ontario in 1875, he came to Manitoba in 1907 and oversaw the construction of the Pointe de Bois Hydroelectric Generating Station on the Winnipeg River. This facility, which became operational in 1911, supplied the city of Winnipeg with abundant year-round electricity. Chase later returned to Manitoba as chief engineer for the Winnipeg Aqueduct, that brought water from Shoal Lake to the city, thereby providing it with one of the best water supplies in North America. A lesser known project in which Chase was involved began in 1934, when he designed a hydroelectric generating station considerably smaller than the one at Pointe de Bois, to be built on the Canuchuan River in northeastern Manitoba. The reason for its construction was that gold had been discovered in the area of God's Lake, and electricity was needed to concentrate the ore. At a cost of a half a million dollars, roughly 10 million in today's dollars, the Canuchuan generating station was built. An 1,100 foot long channel and forebay were excavated on the north bank of the Canuchuan River. It diverted river flow to a concrete and wood powerhouse designed to enclose up to three electricity generators, although only one generator was ever installed. The station produced 1.4 megawatts of electricity for transmission over a 42-mile line to the gold mine on Elk Island near the community of God's Lake. A license to operate the generating station was issued in October of 1936. Exhaustion of the ore body led to closure of the gold mine and its generating station in 1943, a mere eight years after they began operating. The company's assets, including the generating station and its transmission line, were sold in 1948 to a company that intended to use them to power a mine in western Ontario. That development never occurred, and ownership of the generating station reverted to the Manitoba government when the company's license expired in December 1975. Meanwhile, back in the mid-1960s, the generating station was inspected by Manitoba Hydro engineers and found to be in operating condition. And although the spillway was partially washed out sometime after 1958, a small amount of power was being used locally at a fishing camp located just above the intake. 
Remarkably, although the small generating station had had no maintenance in decades and its operating staff was long gone, it was still operating, although apparently hampered by a failing bearing that caused the generator to thump rhythmically as it turned, as recently as the late 1980s. At that time, several buildings and vehicles were still present at the site, including a large crane that was used to construct the forebay and which was presumably simply abandoned there when the work was done. The last vestiges of the gold mine were removed by the provincial government in the 2000s, but the Kanuchuan generating station is still there, although most of the river's flow now bypasses it. I have hoped for the past few years of finding a way to get there, to see in what condition the generator is now, and whether it's still turning. The fact that a hydroelectric generating station could run for decades after it was abandoned is a testament to the skill with which it was designed and built by a dedicated engineer so many years ago. One of the most popular recent episodes of Abandoned Manitoba dealt with a discovery made by one of my friends of a structure buried underground along a remote road on the west shore of Lake Winnipeg, north of Hecla Island. It took some research to find out that the structure had been built in the early 1960s as part of a network to monitor radioactive fallout in the event of a nuclear detonation somewhere in Canada or the United States. The concern at that time, of course, was that Soviets would drop a nuclear bomb in North America and large areas would have to be evacuated. The Canadian government decided to build about 2,000 fallout monitoring posts across the country, including about 200 of them in Manitoba. Many of the posts were situated in settled parts of the province, so they were simply created in a walled-off corner of the basement in such buildings as post offices, police stations, train stations, and other public facilities. But in areas where there were no existing buildings, an underground structure would be built. Each would accommodate two people who would collect air samples to measure levels of radiation, then radio the results to a central coordinating station. There, the results from many such posts would be integrated to provide detailed radiation maps. Fortunately, the network was never needed, although a test was made in August of 1962, suggesting that at least some parts of it were actually constructed. This photo of the underground monitoring post along Highway 6, south of Grand Rapids, is a typical design of one of the remote posts. A vertical cylindrical pipe containing a ladder led down into a larger diameter horizontal pipe that was the main living space for the two occupants, with two beds and shelving for storage of supplies. Ventilation shafts leading above the ground would be used to collect air samples. It is unclear how power, water, and other necessities were provided to the post, but it appears not to have been designed for long-term occupancy. There were at least two variations on the design of the posts, suggesting that construction was done by more than one contractor. In this case, the metal of the two parts was smooth, whereas the post found north of Hecla Island was made of corrugated metal. The arrangement of the interior also varied somewhat. Sometimes the bunk beds were on the side, as seen here, and in other configurations they were at one end, opposite the entry stair. It is unknown how many of the 200 posts planned for Manitoba were ever built. An intriguing question that remains to be answered is, how many of these posts are still intact? I have heard of at least one in the basement of a former RCMP station, and at least three underground ones. This map provided to me by a historian at the Canadian War Museum in Ottawa, provides tantalizing clues to where others are located, although I suspect the coordinates for each of them are only approximate. It's possible that many more symbols of the fear that Canadians experienced during the Cold War may await future discovery. I have had so much fun over the past five years of the Abandoned Manitoba radio series, sharing my discoveries with listeners, and I can't foresee that it will end any time soon. I encourage people watching this presentation to check out the website of the Manitoba Historical Society, where we have information on many other interesting historic sites around the province. You may also be interested in my two best-selling books, Abandoned Manitoba and its sequel, More Abandoned Manitoba, that delve more deeply into a few of my other favourite historic sites. So thanks for your attention today.